Welcome to another episode of the Soul Savvy Podcast. My name is Tariq Ahmed, and I'm a community leader on our team. Today, I am joined by New York City legend, ball player, DJ, radio host, award-winning filmmaker, designer, and the forefather of sneaker journalism, Bobito Garcia. How you ah. doing? Yo, I'm gonna take you on a roll with me when I start DJing again. You can just introduce me, like I had to hold the red carpet for you. I had, to, you know. You remember when, when James Brown used to have his man come out and be like, "Hardworking, yeah, the Godfather of Soul." Like, I want I you to, to introduce me before all my DJ sets. From I got now you. On. I got you. I'm going on the road with you. Word, word. You're looking. How you feeling though? How you How you doing? It's been a long day. I ain't gonna front. It's a blessing to you know have people like yourself reach out allows me to to have voice with a new audience really you know because uh the sneaker world is constantly evolving you know there's always like preteens coming into the mix that may not know the history may not know my contribution to it so um i'm not saying that that's your audience but you know if there, there are young people out there it might be the first time they ever heard my name you know there's gonna be other people who like followed me for the last 30 years and be like yo word like that's my man you know yeah. so um yeah so i appreciate i appreciate the love no love let's get it started um so as i mentioned so savvy is a community driven sneaker platform um mm -hmm. we're dedicated to helping people enjoy sneaker culture which has become more difficult in recent years to pick up anything in a recent interview with high snob you mentioned that your book in your book that there's more people than it was about sneakers, more about the people than it was about the sneakers. How do you define true meaning of sneaker culture and how have you experienced it? <laughs> you, gotta, <laughs> you gotta be kidding, bro. Like, you have five hours for me to do a lecture. I mean, I get paid to do speaking engagements. Like, I did write a book, uh, titled yeah. Where'd You Get Those? Okay. New York City Sneaker Culture, 1960 to 1987. That was published in 2003. We're coming up on a 20th anniversary, amazingly, uh, in two years. Uh, we do have some plans to uh, release a new edition. You know, I mean, there's a lot of material out there, uh, thankfully, you know, to learn and really knowledge yourself in, a, in the right way about sneaker culture. For me to try to uh, encompass all that I know and experience in the interviews, it's, it's impossible. It's, it's, I, I couldn't. I'm better at uh, sort of pointing your your readers and listeners to things that I've already done that could help guide them and help answer that that question fully. I basically experienced sneaker culture at its inception. I'm born in 1966. You know, I'll be 55 in a few months. Sneaker culture did exist prior to me being on this earth, but because I was raised in the 70s during the burgeoning hip hop years as well as the, you know, the explosion of playground basketball outdoors. And I grew up in New York. These sort of three movements and cultures and communities really like intertwined and were separate at the same time to create, you know, sneaker culture as we know it now, which is derivative in 2021. It's derivative of what I experienced in the 70s and 80s uh, and, and, and part of what I experienced in the 90s. Sneaker culture pretty much has stayed constant in the last 20 years with the with the exceptions of you know the reseller market which has become huge we didn't sell our, uh try to sell our sneakers back in the 70s and 80s but we did trade softly worn shoes you know with our tightest friends to to get a pair of joints that you couldn't get you know some sneakers now have value that uh, that's only monetary not cultural right like this the sneaker does not look fresh like it doesn't look dope on anybody. It looks whack, but it's limited. It's by a certain brand. It's got it. Maybe it's it's a collab with a, a famous designer or you know artist or personality, and then it brings monetary value and people resell it, and then people think that it's hot. So, you know, it's that happens in the art world. That happens in the carpet world. You know, happens in the trading card world. You know, value is what. I mean, you can even look at uh, Bitcoin. You know, value is what someone decides something has. And if someone says, yo, those beat up Chuck Taylors are worth $5,000, then that's what they valued it at. And if someone else values it more, then it could be traded and sold. Um, so it's an interesting phenomenon, but I always try to tell people to, you know, come back to the design. Right. Come back to, you know, how does it look on your foot? Uh, how does someone wear it, you know? How does it make you feel when you when you see it on the wall in the store or when you're on a train and you see somebody walk by and you're like, oh, you know, like, oh, it's just struck by the by, by the godliness, you know, like, yo, you know, 
it's like everybody goes through that and I, I still go through that you know I'm, I'm a little bit uh past the the uh the edginess of being like an addict you know as i might have been in the 90s when i wrote the first article in, in media history about stinker culture it was titled confessions of a stinking Add addict and at that point i was an addict you know i couldn't couldn't pass a day without thinking about sneakers somehow some way you know how i was going to get a pair how i was going to wear this pair how i was going to customize this pair uh that's not my reality now i'm in my 50s um but i understand it and i documented it so i know it well the first time i saw you honestly was on a just for kicks documentary you know i was on nike talk and those are like my my times are coming up in sneakers and i actually want to talk about the air force one so I know you collabed with Nike back in 2007. You did seven pairs. Can you touch on that collaboration on like, how did it get started and the emotions you felt actually holding your your own Air Force One? Absolutely, I will keep it 100 with you. Uh, yeah. I was a little upset at the swoosh because I was consulting them as well as Wyden and Kennedy, the ad agency, dating back to 1993. You know, I was involved with a, a, a number of legendary campaigns including the freestyle commercial in 2001 but you know even going back before that in 94 95 i was sort of a cultural ambassador for the first city attack campaign which uh, hit new york it was the first hyper local uh marketing campaign that nike or wyden and kennedy had ever done or i mean for the industry period doing location scouting for them and and casting for them and appearing uh, at events and and on on posters and voicing you know commercials and the one eight hundred number uh, <laughs> NYC Yoke one eight hundred NYC Yoke and you know uh, I mean I did so much for the brand that really connected Nike to New York in a way that they've never slipped I mean they control New York they own it and I feel good that I was part of that um, because Nike has, has given a lot back to the basketball community here in in the last 26 27 years you know that said though that you know there's a lot of conversations throughout the 90s of like yo bob you know we should do a pair of sneakers for you like yo we should, we should put out a sneaker you know this is in, in the 90s when you know somebody like me was there was no such thing as collabs with a sneaker personality you know the collabs were only like well we just signed you know penny hardaway you know that's that's the collab is with you know the nba athlete it was a little bit before that era and then in 99 i was asked like yo if you could do your own sneaker what would it be and i you know i told him like yo gum bottom burgundy suede my name on the side you know and then that was it you know it just kind of like never went anywhere and then it was uh 2002 i believe chris amen from nike uh was announcing the nike battleground one-on-one -on -one, uh tournament on the intrepid the uss intrepid and, uh, and he came up to me in front of all the contestants. It was like, yo, I got a box for you. And it was white box, boom. And he gave me the Air Force Ones with my name on the side. You know, that was cool, but that was kind of like a gift. And that's what it was, you know, it wasn't like out for retail. And then over the years, you know, people who held me dear in the sneaker space were getting collabs and asking for my opinion, you know, De La Soul, uh, Stash, like, yo, what do you think of these? Like, yo, I, I, I gotta get, get you a pair of these. And, you know, and I was just seeing like an activity that I wasn't a part of, but felt like I warranted that, you know, I, I deserved that, you know, um, I did a lot for the brand. I, I did a lot for the culture. Yeah. Right? yeah. Like, let's keep it 100. You know what I'm saying? Like I could encourage everyone in your audience to watch a film called Rock Rubber 45. It's an autobiographical doc documentary that details all of my contributions that I, I made to the sneaker universe. I had a great relationship with Fraser Cook, not because he was a Nike employee, but because me and him used to get invited to like Nike events together. You know, he was kind of like what I was for New York, but in London. And, um, but you know, he got snatched up uh, by the business and, you know, I felt like I had a rapport with him and, and I, you know, I gave him a mouthful. I was like, yo, like, why are all these people doing collabs? And I'm not like, What's up with that? You know, y'all hit me up every time you need me for something, and I always hit it out the park. Like by far, I'm always available for the brand. I'm not exclusive to you, but I'm always loyal. You know, and so he was like, "No, no, no, I, I got you." Like he came. This is a 2005, actually, 
because it or 2006 it was like a year and a half before the sneakers actually came out we went back and forth he was like yo we got this air force one uh celebration coming up you should be a part of it you should curate not just like a one of one but like a whole series you know and so i did seven shoes i did four high cut high cut and i did uh three low cut and um you know knocked it out the park i don't know they never shared with me how many pairs they they manufactured i'm imagining probably like around four thousand each imagining yeah. you know um they sold out numerous stores you know i've seen them valued for 650 700 dollars i don't see a cut of that um but i'm 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 honored by it you know uh i've done collabs with puma clyde uh, puma suede um pro k royal flash adidas superstar k to shelto i made my own shoe for piola called the porfin which means at last so i've had my fair share of incredible collabs with a number of brands um and i'm proud of all of them um the air force one in particular though was like that was like ridiculously special because if you read my book where'd you get those new york city sneaker culture 1960 1987 like you'll see that that sneaker was a game changer not just for the sport but for me personally as well yeah this sample came in it was tonal um you know with the uh the waterproof um uh can uh canvas and um you know the 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 little love symbol on the back for my nickname cool by love you know that was over basketball because the red and blue the puerto rico flavors were like basically inspired by, by basketball and then um the uh the 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 beef and broccoli and the mac and cheese were more inspired by hip-hop so with those you see my hand over a 12 inch record you know i giggled when dj premier came to the crib you know i was like wow premier's at the crib you know pick up a pair of sneakers that design i was dope yeah. uh, when clark kent uh posted about them like you know 10 years later like and they're crispy you know out the box and he's on instagram posting about them and you know it gets like you know however many thousands of likes that was like special because clark is like he's he's the god you know what i'm saying like rakim is the god the god mc like clark Kent is the god sneaker cat but i think my favorite moment might simply be i was at ps84 it's a playground where i played a tournament and uh the pasta classic and there were two players on my squad that had the 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 blue and red the red white blue um air force one times cool bob loves to play in 2007 my dude you Ooh. know what i'm saying like to play not to sport not to chill to play and that's when i was like that's the shit right there yeah. that's the shit you know what i'm saying like so that felt really good you can feel man like people really actually playing in your shoe because that's what they're meant to be for you know styling and also you know playing in. so i know that like a very special moment that you felt i did the puma collab in 2016 i did the puma suede 50th anniversary mm -hmm. in uh in 2018 and you know i've never seen anyone playing in those shoes i've seen people wear them hard like fresh with the outfit and everything like you know at the club at the event like yo bob what's up check him out like world snap yo good look at you know pow damn yo i'm not i dogged them up i need another pair yo good look at work but i've never seen somebody wear the pumas that i designed you know whereas like i saw people play ball in the air force ones so that was that that's even like next level you know i know you went to lord marion high school i did yes. 1984. nice yo <laughs> well i was there from 1982 to 1984 and that's detailed and, and there's a whole scene about my years at lord marion in my last film rock rubber 45s as we all know the late legend kobe went there um as a hooper yourself what kind of impact do you think Kobe had on the game for basketball and sneakers, um, period? Come on, B, that's immeasurable. <laughs> that's immeasurable. I mean, I got a chance to, to meet him about three, four times. Not meet him, I mean, like, I met him once. And then, you know, the, the three, four times we crossed paths afterwards, he always remembered my name, always, you know, remember who I was, like, greeting me, show love, pound, hug, yo, what's up? You know, so that was dope. Um, and I'm not... I'm not alone in that. I've heard other people say like that he was very um, cunning in his in his manner to remember people. You know, I mean, he was a bright dude. I don't need to say how how great of a ball player was. Everybody knows, you know, five rings and you know the scoring championships and the you know the the 80 point game and the all that. You know, the 50 yeah. 50 plus game at the at the Garden against the Knicks. You know, I think his contribution to to the sneaker spaces is kind of incredible um 
you know, perhaps not on par with Michael Jordan. People argue like, oh, who's better, you know, Kobe or LeBron? I get it. People like to like, you know, have lists and stuff like that. But when it comes to pure like contribution to the sneaker space, it's, it's Jordan. That's it. He's, he's on a mountain of his own. Kobe certainly, you know, his number fours uh, at Nike, the Crazy 8 with Adidas. You know, these are like iconic shoes for their period. His other Kobe's, you know, the, the crazy Kobe's that went crazy high, you know, were like a fashion right. statement. And I hope that Nike continues to keep his sneaker leg legacy alive by infusing it the way they have with Jordan, a current artist do a collab with the Jordan one to give it, uh, what was the, the Travis, um, Travis you know, Scott but, one. yeah, the Travis Scott joints, you know what I'm saying? Like that infuses new energy in it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. People might love Travis and be 12 years old and not even know who Michael Jordan was, but they'll buy the sneaker. Exactly. So I hope that, that that Nike does the same thing with Kobe. And I'm sure they will. I mean, they're, they're yeah. brilliant, you know, marketing. I can companies. see that happen in the future, too. I can see that happen yeah. in the future. And Nike is known for doing that, too. So, Yeah, I mean, you know, let me put it in out in the universe. I mean, Nike really should have me do a collab with the Kobe oh. 4. Like, real talk. Like, they should have me collab and decide on the colors. I went to Lower Marion. Yeah. I am who I am in the sneaker space. You know, it's like that would be a, a layup. You know what I'm saying? That would be like an open court layup. All right. Well, uh, one more question. With so many new sneakers and like silhouettes releasing like every week, it feels like, is there anything new that still catches your eye? Like any new silhouette or brand wise that just piqued your in interest that you have to have or that's tight or it's dope, you know? There's nothing that I have to have. That sentence is out of my vocabulary. Okay. Um, but there's a scene in Rock Over 45s where I'm doing nonprofit work in the developing area of Africa where there are kids playing ball like barefooted. It's a really powerful, it's a tearjerker scene, quite honestly. Um, and I've been to multiple developing areas around the world where I've seen kids, you know, barefooted playing ball. It's not just Africa. Um, and uh, those types of experiences change, it would change anyone's perspective. I'm also a father, you know, I have a, a seven year old son who I don't uh, feature publicly because I want his life to be private and I want him to be known not as little Babito, but as his own name. And, and uh, but you know, I mean, being a father and being outdoors with a seven year old who's rambunctious has his challenges if you want to be fresh with your sneaker game. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like stomping on my joints, he wants to go to the park. You know, we run around in the grass, like it's not, you know, so my priorities have, have, have changed. So I'm saying all that to say like, there's no sneaker I have to have. Now, are there sneakers that I see come out that I'm like, <gasps> ooh, yes, for sure. Um, the Kyrie 3, which came out, you know, already like whatever, four years ago. That's an amazing shoe uh, yeah. to play ball in. Yeah. I love the Kyrie 3. I got buckets in the Kyrie 3. Uh, and I real talk. I've run a tournament called Full Court 21, and I've done it in 30 international cities since 2015. We'll return in 2022. So anyway, the Kyrie 3s came out in uh, navy blue and and, uh, and metallic gold. Woo! Those are a pair of shoes that I was, you know which ones I'm talking about? I know exactly which ones you're talking about. I forgot yeah. what they were called. They were like something, you know? Yeah. And uh, the Converse Pro BBs, when they first returned to the performance space, I hit up Converse and I was like, you should be ashamed of yourself. The soul of your brand is a basketball silhouette and you're not doing performance. So it's like, you're like a, you're like a shell of a company without a heart, you know? Right. I'm not saying they came back to performance because of me, but I feel like I was part of the, the ethical reasoning for them to come back uh, and certainly a, a, an evangelist for that. Um, so when they came back with the Pro BB in 2019, it was great. Like, you know, one of the ways they thanked me was that they sponsored my tournament, Full Court 21, uh, in particular, the All World Final, which was at uh, the GOAT, AKA Rocksteady Park, which is, you know, legendary playground for the basketball and hip hop community. And the Pro BB for me was like, yo, lightweight, again, similar to the Kyrie 3, like crazy, great to play ball in Mad comfortable. I play ball outdoors. You'll see me playing 100 degree weather. You'll see me playing, you know, snow on the ground. You'll see me playing in the rain, dark outside, I'm playing. So I need a, not only the good pair of shoes, I need a great pair of performance shoes. The Puma uh, Clyde Hardwood, I think is a great shoe as well. Um, and I, I, that's what, mostly what I've been playing in. I'll leave it there, the Kyrie 3, the, Pro, the Converse Pro BB, and the, uh, the Puma Clyde 
hardwood. Those are my three um, that I've been like, mm. yeah, I, actually, I need I need another pair of the, the, the Clyde hardwood. Puma, if you're listening, we're putting it out in the universe. <laughs> I like your shoes. Go ahead Puma and get send them a pair right now, Puma. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Bobito, it was an honor to have you on the Soul Savvy Podcast. Do you have any last words you'd like to share for the people? Go to coolboblove.com. That's spelled with a K. To learn about my book, my films. I'm a music producer. I'm a DJ uh, on Apple Music Hits with Stretch uh, bi-weekly. Um, everything that I'm up to, all the other stuff I do, basketball, tournaments, consulting. Uh, I do, I got a, a basketball um dribbling instructional video called Papito's Basics, the boogie. I mean, you know, I'm a juggler, but you know, I'm a freelance creative and, uh, you know, I'm very happy to have a voice um, in 2021 to inspire and impact people. So that's where it's at, B.